So welcome. Uh, my name is Roger Berkowitz uh, from the Han Arendt Center at Bard College, and we are going to continue with our reading of Hannah Arendt's uh, long essay on violence. Last week, we read part one of the essay. And just a quick refresher, uh, let's start actually at the beginning of part two, which in the book Crisis of the Republic, there's different versions of it, but we'll use this today. Um, she begins with the line in part two on page 134, it is against the background of these experiences that I propose to raise the question of violence in the political realm. And we should remind ourselves that the experiences that she's here referring to, there's a number of them, but the primary one um, is the experience uh, that she says was utterly unknown to generations before the generations of the late 20th century, which is that this is the first generation to grow up under the shadow of the atom bomb. These, this generation inherited from their parents the experience, Arendt writes, of a massive intrusion of criminal violence into politics. She's here, of course, talking about both in Russia and in Germany, the experience of concentration camps, genocide, and torture. Um, and this generation thus has the experience of the possibility of doomsday. I mean, we're not talking about just bad things, but the destruction of the earth. And the result, she says, is that these this generation was characterized by an unexpected, potentially, but real sheer courage, what she calls an astounding will to action and a no less astounding confidence in their ability to change the world. Um, and so these students who began to embrace and at times glorify violence and not just students, but also theorists, um, they were the people who heard the ticking of the bomb, which she says, that in the face of reality that promises a kind of technological disaster and a moral disaster, they wanted to act. And violence became a way of acting, a way of trying to influence and change the world. And what RN says at the end of part one is that um, if violence is imagined as the only way to interrupt such doomsday, uh, to interrupt this kind of progress towards some technological devastation, then we should all be engaged in violence. But she says, actually, it's more complicated than that. On the one hand, violence is not the only way to interrupt such processes. And on the other hand, um, violence is going to prove to be quite dangerous when used to interrupt such processes. In a sense, that's the, those are the next two chapters of the book. Um, chapter Part two of, of the essay uh, is about power and how power as opposed to violence is another way that we can interrupt these technological processes, uh, this movement towards doomsday. And then part three is then going to, after having discussed power, return to violence and show the dangers and and problems of the turn to violence as an attempt to interrupt these processes. So um, part two begins uh, with uh, two histories. There's a mainstream history and an alternate history of the relation between violence and power. And so we're now going to try and say, okay, the, the, the mainstream history says that all politics is a struggle for power and the ultimate kind of power is violence. That's a quote from C. Wright Mills, one of the leading political thinkers of the 20th century. Uh, we can turn to Max Weber as well, who says that the state is the rule of men over men based on the means of legitimate, that is allegedly legitimate, violence. So Weber and Mills and Marx and others have this view that the state is an instrument of oppression in the hands of the ruling class. And um, as a result, the power of the state and the power that comes from politics is actually predicated on oppression and violence. But Arendt says there's another tradition, um, a hidden tradition potentially, uh, that doesn't see the power of the state as based in violence, but sees that government in a constitutional republic uh, is based on not violence, not the rule of man over man, but the rule of law. And it's based upon the power of the people that would, in the end, put the rule of law above the rule of man. Uh, she says on page 139 um, that 
in this tradition, there is a concept of power and law whose essence did not rely on the command obedience relationship and which did not identify power and rule or law and command. So in this tradition, a tradition, a tradition that she traces way back to ancient Greece and ancient Rome, but also more, more recently to uh, the French and the American revolutions, um, power is not the same thing as rule. Law is not the same thing as command. A law is a guidance, she says, and one that we consent to. Power is not a rule over me. It's something I have insofar as I engage in self-rule and self-government. Um, and so she'll write as well on page 139, these examples inspired the American and French revolutionaries, so the examples of Rome and Greece, who strove for a Republican form of government where the rule of law resting on the power of the people would put an end to the rule of man over man. And so what we see here is that for Arendt, if there's a mainstream tradition that says that power and violence are the same, there's another tradition of government that says that actually power is not the same as violence and that actually power as legitimate power um, is different from violent or oppressive rule, it's actually something diff different. And what she wants to now ask, what is power and how is it opposed to violence? And this brings us to these famous uh, series of distinctions she makes beginning on pages um, 142 forward in this edition. And she offers a definition of a number of concepts. And the first thing she says is, it's important to make these distinctions something that we often don't do. We like to say, oh, power is the same thing as violence. Power corrupts, violence corrupts. Uh, power is like authority. Power is like force or strength. And we, 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 we unite all these terms. And what Aaron says is, well, if we're gonna have a meaningful conversation, if we're actually gonna talk about these things, even though there's a lot of similarities between them, we have to be true to the phenomena and distinguish them. And she offers a number of distinctions. And she so she says, first of all, on page 142, it is, I think, a rather sad reflection on the present state of political science that our terminology does not distinguish among such keywords as power, strength, force, authority, and finally violence. And she offers distinctions amongst all these different words. The ones that we're really focused on today are power and violence, which she's going to call opposites, not synonyms. And so the first one I want to talk about is power. She writes on page 143 in the beginning of her definition of power, power corresponds to the human ability not just to act, but to act in concert. Power is to act in such a way that we act together with other people. It can't be something I do myself. Um, strength is something I can act alone in doing, but power is something that I take from the combined activity of many people. Thus she says, power is never the property of an individual. It belongs to a group and remains in existence only so long as the group keeps together. So this is Fundamental to Arendt's understanding of power as opposed to violence, we'll see in a second that violence is like strength in that it's, it's associated with an individual or one person. Power comes from acting together. She says later on page 150, power is the essence of all government, but violence is not. Power is an end in itself. So what does that mean? Power is the essence of government. It means that for Arendt, government is not rule and oppression. Government is rule that is legitimate and thus not really rule. It's actually cooperation. It's working together. It's free coming together to achieve and aim at collective common interests and common purposes. That's what government is. That's what makes that's what human beings can do that ants or, uh, or whales can't. We can come together and act and create lasting, meaningful institutions for the common good. 
It's an end in itself, she says, because power doesn't is not useful for some other particular end. It's simply about creating power, which means good government, government in which we together act in order to achieve common ends. One of the the ends of power, of collective action, is to act powerfully, collectively, and in doing so, live like human beings, having the collective ability to uh, um, control and, uh, in some sense, direct our own lives. Thus, she says, since power is an end in itself, she writes on 151, power needs no justification. You don't need to justify it by some end. The end of power, the justification of power, is power, and it is inherent in the very existence of political communities. But what it does need, she says, is not justification, but legitimacy. Thus, power springs up whenever men get together and act in concert. And so that's what we have to understand power as. It's when a group of people in a small town or in a larger city get together and act, and in doing so, um, create their city, create their town, and in acting, uh, embody what it means to engage in politics, to participate in self-government. This idea of power, which is not rule, but engagement and self-participation in, 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 in government, is opposed to violence. So on page 145, Arendt says, Violence is distinguished by its instrumental character, right? So violence is instrumental. It's not an end in itself. It's an instrument for some other end. And phenomenologically, if you look at it as a phenomenon and you look at violence, she says it is close to strength since the implements of violence, like all other tools, are designed and used for the purpose of multiplying natural strength until in the last stage of their development, they can substitute for it. So whereas power is, a, is, is, is phenomenologically a group phenomena, violence is instrumental. It's about a single or isolated person who uses tools and implements in order to increase his or her strength um, so that they can uh, substitute uh, strength and the implements for strength and thus not need power. Um, the, the obvious, the, the, so just to give us some, some, some images here, the tyrant, right, who uses tanks to control a people is using implements in order to uh, multiply his individual strength, which could never uh, in any way challenge the power of people acting together. The result of that is that if power is the essence of all government, she says, no government, this is on page 149, no government exclusively based on the means of violence has ever existed. This is, of course, a, a provocative claim, but it's an important one to understand what she means. You can't have a government that's simply violent. All governments must have some power, which means they must all have some legitimacy. Even the most awful tyrant in the world, uh, has to have some legitimacy because they have to have some people who are willing to fight for them and enforce their rule against people who might resist. Um, the only exception, she says, and one that at the time she's writing this, she can only imagine, but we can, of course, imagine it a little more easily than she can. The only exception, she says on, one page, on page 149, would be the development of robot soldiers. And if we developed robot shoulders, soldiers, she says, that would permit one man, a tyrant, with a push button to destroy whomever he pleased. And that could change the general fact that power is always ascendant over violence. And it could make it possible for there to be a true government of, of violence. And this is an important point to realize. So for Arendt, the possibility of robot soldiers, of drones, a world we're living in very much right now, actually makes possible something that never has existed in, in, in the history of humankind, which is a government based in violence. Something we should talk about uh, when we meet. 
one, once we understand the difference between power and violence, we need to understand a couple of differences that, that follow from that, a corollaries that follow from that. The first, she says, is that politically speaking, the point is that the loss of power becomes a temptation to substitute violence for power. If power is based in legitimacy and group action, the more that a government loses its legitimacy and people stop engaging in power and, in a sense, uh, give control of their lives to bureaucrats or to authorities and institutions, and people sort of just pursue their private lives without engaging in the act of governance, and thus power dissipates, those authorities will, over time, uh, be increasingly less legitimate. And there is a temptation to substitute violence for power as a way of maintaining their control. Um, that's one corollary. Another is that in a head-on clash, and this is on page 152, in a head-on clash between violence and power, the outcome is hardly in doubt, right? While power, she says, is ascendant over violence, that's only because she doesn't imagine there will ever be pure violence. There's not a government of pure violence because all government needs some power, some legitimacy. But if there were a head-on class, the outcome is not in doubt. And she gives the example, if Gandhi's enormously powerful and successful strategy of nonviolent resistance, which was powerful, right, had met a different enemy like Stalin's Russia or Hitler's Germany, or we could say Assad's Syria, instead of England, the outcome would not have been decolonization, but massacre and submission. If you're willing to just use absolute violence with no concern about legitimacy, you will destroy power because you'll destroy all people. Um, and so that's the second uh, corollary, which is that in a head-on clash, if you're, if you're ruthless, violence will beat power. Um, and so the third corollary is that if you are ruthless and you try and do that, you'll end up losing. So she says, to substitute violence for power can bring victory, right? Assad is victorious in, 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 in Syria. But the price is very high, for it is not only paid by the vanquished, it is also paid by the victor in terms of their own power. The point here is that the victor, Assad, loses power, loses legitimacy, and while he uh, is able to win in the short term, he will lose in the long run. And she says the only extreme way to, uh, to address this, the only extreme way to hold power when you've lost your power and your legitimacy uh, is, is through terror. And terror, she says on pages 153 to 154, is the use of violence to maintain domination, but it's a form of government in which it attempts to destroy all power. And so she'll say in other, in other essays of hers and other books, that terror requires not only the destruction of all political institutions, but it requires the destruction of all chess clubs and all horseback riding clubs. Because in every chess club, and every horseback riding club, there's people acting together and they have some power. And it also requires the destruction of all families, which is why the core instrument of terror is the ubiquitous informer. You must feel that there's no one you can trust, not your friends in the horseback riding club, not your friends, not your family, not your children. Everyone can inform on you. And that becomes uh, the epitome of a terror regime, one in which violence can destroy all forms of power and power can be eviscerated. Um, the last point I wanna make in, in this section, uh, in section two of this essay, is her discussion of what we call the revolutionary situation. Um, she talks about what it might mean for a revolution to happen. What are the necessary conditions for a revolution? And the first necessary condition for a revolution um, is the disintegration of power. As long as there's power in a nation or in a country or in a people or in a local government, as, and as long as there's any power or any meaningful power and thus legitimacy, it's going to be very hard to have a revolution. Now, what does it mean to have a disintegration of power? 
It means, she says, that power is lying in the streets. Power is disintegrated. And the obvious marker for that is when the henchmen of the tyrant or the henchmen of the ruler no longer will enforce the ruler's commands against the people, right? It's when the army refuses to shoot. It's when the police refuse to keep to make arrests. It's when the army doesn't shoot the man in the white shirt in Tiananmen Square. Those are just moments of disintegrations of power. Um, and uh, until there's and and until there's a disintegration of power, she says you can't have a revolution. But once there is a disintegration of power, revolutions become possible. It doesn't mean they'll happen, but they become possible. But one thing we can say is that um, in order to have for power to disintegrate, sometimes it needs to be confronted, right? Often the power will last, the police will continue to work, the army will continue to work, but it's, an, it's not until someone challenges them, someone stands up and says, shoot me, right? Someone acts with courage, stands up and says, come on, are you really going to shoot me for praying in front of you in the street? Are you really going to shoot me for waving a white flag in front of the tank? That's when power can disintegrate. Um, and so she'll say on page 147, on 148, everything depends on the power behind the violence. The sudden dramatic breakdown of power that ushers in revolutions reveals in a flash how civil, how civil obedience to laws, to rulers, or to institutions is but the outward manifestation of support and consent. And that's a very important point. As long as people obey their civil obedience, um, that is a manifestation of support. It's not just obedience. It's also support and consent. And she has this very famous line in her book on Eichmann in Jerusalem, where she says, in politics, obedience and support are the same. And what she means that by that is very clearly that when you obey in a political world, you are also supporting, which is why someone like Eichmann is morally responsible for what he did and not simply an obedient cog. She says on page 147, in a contest of violence against violence, the superiority of the government has always been absolute, right? If two people, two, if, if it's your violence against my violence, the government's going to win. The violence, government's always more violent than me. But this superiority, she says, lasts only as long as the power structure of the government is intact. That is, as long as commands are obeyed and the army or police forces are prepared to use their weapons. When this is no longer the case, the situation changes abruptly. And it's that abrupt situation change um, where uh, power disintegrates and the disintegration can lead to a revolution. And thus on 148, she says again, disintegration often becomes manifest only in direct confrontation, which is why sometimes you need to confront the military or confront the police in order to test the question of whether there is still power in that place. But even if the power disintegrates, even if the military, the police, the institutions will not enforce the commands and rules of the rulers of the state, that doesn't mean there'll be a revolution, she says. She says there also needs to be some group of men prepared to pick up and assume responsibility, right? The fact that both on the right with Donald Trump and others and on the left with Bernie Sanders right now, there's a lot of people in the United States calling for a revolution suggests that there's a sense. Uh, uh, moment yet, because I don't think we're at a point where the police or the army are ready to disobey, right? But there's a sense that power is certainly disintegrating, and it might disintegrate further. But even if it disintegrates, she says, a revolution will only happen if someone picks it up and assumes responsibility. And she says, this was the failure of the revolutionaries in the 1960s. The students challenged the university in France and elsewhere, and what they found was that people listened to them and that power disintegrated, but no one picked it up. There was no one there to pick up the power and create a new politics, a new power. And thus in her essay, 
her, 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 her interview, Politics and Thoughts on Politics and Revolution, which is published in the same volume as On Violence, uh, Crisis in the Republic. She says on page 206, and I'm going to end with this, I'm just going to point you towards this, this passage. She says, quote, at the moment, one prerequisite for coming revolution is lacking, a group of real revolutionaries. Just what the students on the left would most like to be, revolutionaries, that is what they are not. Nor are they organized as revolutionaries. They have no inkling of what power means. And if power were lying in the street and they knew it was lying there, they are certainly the last to be ready to stoop down and pick it up. That is precisely what revolutionaries do. So on the one hand, revolutionaries are people who pick up power. What is power? Power is acting in concert. They pick it up and they say, we together will promise and contract and make pacts to create a government. So why aren't the students ready to pick up power? Because they don't know what power is? Because they are not yet ready to pick it up. She says, and that's not a, it's not a question of being armed or using violence. So she continues, armed uprising by itself has never yet led to a revolution. Nevertheless, what could pave the way for a revolution is a real analysis of the existing situation, such as used to be made in earlier times. In this respect, I see absolutely no one near or far in a position to do this. The theoretical sterility and analytical dullness of this movement are just as striking and depressing as its joy is in action is welcome. So while the students in the 1960s, and I think we can say many, much of the same thing as about both the Tea Party movement and the Occupy movement today, has led to joy in action, the action has not led to power because there has not been a theoretical richness to the people leading these movements, to the people involved in these movements that have understood where the power would go. They understand that power has disintegrated. They understand the problems of liberal democracy. They understand the problems of our corrupt rigged system. But nobody has yet come up with a meaningful, theoretically rich, analytically precise sense of how to create and pick up power in the modern age. And that and until that happens, RN says, revolutions, the revolutionary situation will remain that, a revolutionary situation without a revolution. And when such power is lacking, there will always be the impulse to turn to violence. And that's what part three is going to be about, the dangers of that turn to violence instead of power. So I look forward to speaking with you, and we'll continue with part three in the next month. Thank you very much. Enjoy reading Hannah Arendt.